Hey guys, welcome back. So today in this video I'm going to go over the basics of heap overflow exploitation and basically how to exploit a very simple heap overflow in a basic example program that I'm going to leave a download link to. So heap overflow exploits are what most of modern today exploits um, revolve around. There's very rarely any buffer overflow exploits in most modern advanced systems. The majority of real world exploits now revolve around the heap. So if you're interested in exploitation and security research, then this is definitely one of the most needed things. So hopefully this video will help you get a basic understanding of heap overflows. Now there are very many different ways of exploiting heap overflows, and there's very different um, there's many different versions of heap overflows and ways they occur. But this video will be a very specific example, one of the most easiest examples to learn and to explain. So just want to quickly mention that this video is mostly targeted at the ARM platform and specifically iOS devices. But heap overflows do occur in any system, so you can follow along with anything covered in this video with another system. So the only thing, if you want to follow in exactly with this video, then you'll need to use an iOS device because that's what my example program has been compiled for. But there are many other uh, heap overflow exploit example programs out there that you can download for things such as Windows, OS X, Linux, stuff like that. So as this video is targeted at iOS, we're going to be using an iPhone, and I'm going to be using an iPhone 5C, which is a 32-bit device. I recommend that you also use a 32-bit device, but you can follow along with 64-bit if you want. So of course it does need to be jailbroken so we can download a few essential tools and actually run the example program. So once you've got your jailbroken device, you want to go ahead and open up Cydia, go down to the sources section, edit, add, and you want to add the repo which will be down below in the description. It's cydia.radar with an e on the end, .org. Add source, and once this is added, inside of here you will have a few different command line tools that you can download. Now the repo is actually owned by the people who created the Radar 2 uh, disassembler, but for this video, to keep it simple, we're going to be using GDB instead. So you want to search for GDB, download GDB, and this is basically the same thing as Radar or Radar 2, but it's a more simplified version and it's all we're going to really need for this video. You can still use this on Radar if you want. You can search for Radar and you get the ARM32 version, or the one without anything on the end of it is just for 64-bit version. So choose whichever uh, disassembler program you want. Uh, as I said, we're using GDB in this video, so if you want to follow along exactly, then download GDB. So once you've got that downloaded, you want to go ahead and download the example program from my GitHub page. So go to the link in the description, it will take you to my exploit exercises repo. And there are a few different programs on here. The one we're going to be using is Heap Level 1. Uh, there are a few other ones as well. If you want to check them out, there's other videos on this channel as well as my second channel covering those. But you want to download Heap Level 1. You want to download it as a zip by using the desktop site. You want to click on the download button. And then you want to open that in iFile. So make sure you do have iFile or another file manager installed on your iOS device. And once that's opened, you want to unarchive the zip, and inside you'll see two files. You'll see the executable for heap level one, which is the program we're going to be actually exploiting, and you'll see a readme.txt, which basically just explains a few objectives of this challenge. And so finally, the last thing that you might need is mobile terminal or M terminal on your device, so you can follow along exactly on the device itself. But for this video, and for what I recommend for you guys, is to actually do it from a computer, such as a Mac, uh, using terminal to SSH into the device because that way you have a more clear view of what you're actually doing and you don't have to type on the mobile keyboards so you can actually use um, the shortcuts on the Mac keyboard and it's a lot easier to see so for this video we're going to be using my Mac and you want to SSH into it so you need the IP address so go to the settings application go into the Wi-Fi settings and then click on the blue eye for the Wi-Fi you're already connected to note down the IP address and then on the Mac, you want to type SSH space root at this IP address, enter that, and then enter the password, and you should be in the device. So before we get started with the actual exploit challenge, let's quickly take a look at a couple differences between the stack and the heap. So first of all, the stack is used for static memory allocation, and the push and pop instructions in ARM are used to interact with it. So you can basically push will add a value to the top of the stack, and pop will remove the top value from the stack. And you should have known that from my previous videos on ARM assembly and my other buffer overflow videos involving the stack. And uh, as well as storing data and other variables for the program, the stack also stores the function return address, which is normally what you want to overwrite when exploiting the stack overflow because you can then redirect the program anywhere. And that's what makes exploiting a stack overflow so easy. That's literally all you have to do take control of the program counter and you're free to do whatever you want. The heap, on the other hand, is used for dynamic memory allocation and it's interacted with by programs and applications using malloc and free most commonly and uh, unlike the stack it does not store function return addresses um, normally so this means if you overflow the heap then you can't really overflow any critical address meaning it's a lot harder to actually gain control of the program's execution flow. 
There's also many more differences between these two, but for this video, these are the only ones you really need to know. So now we're actually ready to get started and take a look at this heap level one example program. So make sure you're in the same directory as the program. You can check it's there by doing ls and you should see the executable. There it is. And we can run this by doing dot slash followed by the name of the program, enter and it will run. Now you can see there we didn't actually give any arguments. So we get this usage message telling us how to use the program. So it says run it with a username. So we're going to do that again. We're going to do a space and then we're going to type my name, enter, and this time it says, welcome to heap level one created by me. User Billy is executing command date. And then the date is printed out, which is a shell command. And then the program just exits. So the program seems simple enough. All it does is take a user input for their name and then tells you that the name is executing the date shell command and then it executes the command and exits. So that's pretty much all this program does. Very, very simple. So to analyze a little bit more about how we exploit this, we're going to first of all disassemble it and produce the assembly code so we can see what's actually going on behind the scenes. So for this, you can use either GDB, Radar2, or any other disassembler. You can even use ones on OS X or Windows, such as IDA Pro. But for the simplicity of this video, we'll just be using GDB. So we're going to type GDB space heap level one, which is the name of the binary, and enter. And if this works correctly, you should maybe see a few errors up here, but this doesn't matter. When you see this GDB, here we're inside of GDB. So here we can type commands that allow us to explore this program and how it works. So first of all, every program has a main function. So we're going to disassemble the main function. So type disass space main, enter that, and it will produce you the assembly code. Now, unfortunately, it's all in the same color text. It's just black and white, this terminal. So if you use radar2 or something else, it actually gives you colors and syntax highlight, and it actually makes it a little bit easier to see. But we can still sort of understand what's going on here. So we can see, first of all, the prologue of the function where it sets up the stack and does a few things that we don't really care about. Then we have a few different branches with links to these addresses. Now, these are function calls, basically. So we can see a number of different function calls throughout the main function, which are called into different places and basically call in functions in libc or anywhere else. So GDB doesn't actually tell us the name of the function that's being called. It just gives us the address. So we're actually going to quickly use uh, radar2 by typing r2 space heap level 1 and this is a little bit more advanced and this will actually give you the name of the address so you can see we got a little bit of color straight away we want to type aaa for to automatically analyze everything then you want to type afl so we can see all of the functions and you can see the sim main is the main function type s space then the name of that to seek to this function and then pdf to print the disassembly and you can see this is a lot clearer to see because we get color coordination so this is the same assembly code output as what GDB just gave us, but we get a little more help uh, from Radar. So you can see here, instead of just having a BL to an address, we actually get the function name. And you can see malloc, which is something I said about earlier. Malloc is used to allocate memory on the heap. So we can see a malloc there. We can see another malloc up here. We're going to start from the top. So you can see again, function prolog. And then we have a printf, which print some text on the screen. So we're just going to assume that's something to do with the welcome message, which it is. Um, then we have the mallocs down here. So we have two mallocs, meaning there's two objects being allocated on the heap. And you can look at these numbers. These happen to be the number of bytes on the heap that is being allocated, so hex 80. Then we have stir copy, which is a vulnerable function, which is why this program is actually going to be vulnerable. We have another stir copy down here. And then we have a few more printfs. Then we have a system call. Now, this is what uh, we're going to assume is what calls the date command, which is what prints out the date when we enter our username. So to understand a bit more about how this program works and how we can exploit it, we're going to quickly draw a bit of a mental image of what goes on behind the scenes with the heap when this program runs. So first of all, we're going to skip the first section. This just does a check whether you've supplied an input or not. And if not, it will just exit after printing off that little message. It tells you how to use the program. But um, here is where it really starts. So first of all, you can see that we move hex value 80, which is 128, into R1, and then we call malloc. So this is meaning that we're allocating a new heap object of size hex 80 or 128. So we'll just call this heap object 1, and it doesn't really matter what address this is at, but you can see here the zeros basically represent the reserved memory for um, whatever we want to put in this heap object. So it's empty at the moment. Then we do the same thing. We move hex 80 into r1 again and call malloc again meaning we're allocating a second heap object and this heap object goes right beneath the first one so we have heap object 2 now with the same size as the first one so we both we have two heap objects with nothing in them just 
completely zero. Um, and then we get down to here. So first of all, we can see this date uh, string, and this is moved into a register. And then we have a call to stir copy, which moves a string into a buffer. And that buffer happens to be heap object two. Now that's quite a key part. It's not heap object one. It's heap object two. The date string, which is the command that's going to be executed eventually, gets copied into the heap object two, so the second heap object. So the x's will now just represent the hex for date. Um, it's not actually obviously, but that will just represent the date word. So that's now stored in heap object two. Now after that, we have a few more things, and then we have another call to stir copy. And what this one does is actually copies the user's input, meaning the user's name, into the first heap object. So the one above the one we've just put something into, this one is now going to be uh, is now going to contain the user's name. So if we enter Billy, like I did in the example, Billy will now be stored in heap object one. And as all goes well, if it all goes well, then it should just print out a few things and then system on the second heap object, which we'll call that command and then exit. So as you'll probably know, stir copy is a very vulnerable function because it does not check the length of the string being copied. So however many characters you enter, it will try to copy all of that into the buffer, even if the length of the string is more than the buffer can actually hold. So as we've only got 128 bytes in both of these heap buffers, if we enter more than 128 bytes, for example, if we enter 200 A's into the program, you will see the 4141s all over the heap, as you can see here, because that's the hex representation of it. But if you enter more than the 128, then they will start to overflow into the heap object too, because that's stored underneath it on the heap. So you'll see that some of the data there will get overwritten with the A's. So we're just going to quickly check this works. So we're going to run heap level one, and we're going to use Perl by using the dollar sign, and then we're going to Perl dash E print, and Perl will basically allow us to create a really large string without to actually type it out. So we're going to do a times 200, so to print 200 A's, and it will put that into the program. So if we enter that, what you see now is we get welcome to heap level one, then we get user with the name that we entered, huge name, is executing command, and for some reason the command is no longer date. You can see the command is actually A's as well, and then we get an error because the A command is not found. So you can see that's basically what happened behind the scenes. We overflowed the name uh, into the heap object that stored the date command. So what we can actually do with this is especially craft this string so that we can actually execute any co uh, any command of our choice. And what you can do with GDB is actually see that happening in real time by setting breakpoints and then examining the heap. So you can see I've set a breakpoint here after the two mallocs and then I've set a breakpoint after the two uh, stir copies. So we're just going to run this with all of these A's again. And you'll see we stop at the first breakpoint. What we can do is examine the registers. You can see this value in R0 is the return value of malloc, meaning the address of the second object on the heap. Then we can examine this, so we can examine 64 bytes after this address. And you can see that the heap is currently all zero, just as we predicted with the diagram before. Then we're going to continue the execution, we get to the second breakpoint, and then we're going to do the same thing. And you can see it now contains 4141 because we've overflown from the first object into the second. So the date has now been overwritten completely with A's. So what we want to do now is actually find the point of the string that we enter as the username that actually ends up to start overwriting the date command. And then we can just place whatever shell command we want there and execute it. So we're going to run the heap level one again using a patterned input this time. Now a patterned input is basically an input that we can easily recognize when we find a certain point in it. So you can use sort of programs like such as pattern create, which will do this for you. But since it's quite a simple program, we're just going to type out the alphabet by each letter, do it four times. So all the way through. And we're going to run that. And you can see that actually isn't long enough to overflow. So we still, it, it takes this as a username, but it still executes the date command because this string is not lo long enough to overwrite the second object on the heap. So what we want to do is now just basically double this. So we're just going to do the same thing but paste it twice into that and you can see that seems to be long enough because it tries to execute this command. Now what we can see because it's actually patterned and it's not all the same character we can see where it tries to execute. So we can see executing command ggggghhh etc. So it goes on to the rest of the alphabet. Now we notice that this starts at g. Now this can't be the first g in the alphabet repetition because that string wasn't long enough. So this has to be the second g meaning that 
the shell command we want to execute, we need to place it uh, instead of the second G. So we're going to copy the string up until the second G. So we go through it once. Here's the end of the first alphabet. Then we go through again up until the Fs. And after that is the G. So we want to copy everything before that. Copy. And then we're going to do, we're going to run heap level one again with this input. And now anything we type after that is going to end up being written into the second heat buffer, which will basically override the command. So we can put any command we want here. So we're just going to start with something simple. We'll put ls. Then we'll just chuck a few spaces just to make sure we don't get any problems. And then enter. Now what you can see, we get user with this long name is executing command ls. So we basically chose a command um, without the program basically wanting us to. So the program is not designed to be able to do this, but we've overflowed the heap and actually taken control of this command to change it to wherever we want. And you can see it does print out the contents of this directory. Now, what you could do if you were on, uh, if you wanted to get access to a full, uh, full access to a machine, you could do this and actually run bin sh, which would give you a new shell. So, so instead of ls, we want to type slash bin slash sh, couple of spaces, enter that, and now what we see is that it's executing command bin sh, and now we get a prompt where we're actually in a shell. So now we can type any other command we want. So you can see we can type uname, who am I? Unfortunately, if you were doing this from a mobile user, you'd still only be mobile, but so it's not actually a privilege escalation, but it does give you control of the command line for a machine. So if you're on a program that basically doesn't let you have access to the command line and it just lets you use the program, then using something like this, you could actually gain a root shell or a shell, not a root shell, but a shell to allow you to do some things. So you can do whatever you want in here depending on your permissions. So for example, we could create a new file in um, Flash so you can see test we just create a file and uh, that is basically how a very simple form of a heap overflow exploit works so hopefully this video explained a bit about how the heap works itself and hopefully from here you can go on to learn more complicated heap overflow exploits as I said there are many different ones and this is very very basic and a very um, unreal world kind of example version of it but hopefully it does help you understand the heap a bit better if you have any more questions about it then leave a comment or talk to me on Twitter and also leave a comment about any other kind of videos related to this that you want me to make in the future. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe for more and I will see you next time.